So let me see if I got this straight. You want to learn how to play this game? To be honest with you, unless you already look like something like this, you are probably going to have a very hard time, but hey, that's what you're here for. By the time I'm done with you, you're gonna look like this is combined with this. Now, before we get into learning how to play Hearts of Iron 3, there's a couple of things I have to address. First and foremost, there's another game out there that you might have seen, might have seen some gameplay, and it's obviously Hearts of Iron 4. And you might be thinking, why don't I just learn how to play Hearts of Iron 4 when it's clearly a much newer game and with better visuals? Now, for me personally, one of the reasons why I don't particularly like Hearts of Iron 4 as much as Hearts of Iron 3 is that I think that they have oversimplified the game. The Hearts of Iron franchise is a game series that is relatively complex, and that is some of the joy in the game. Once you've learned all of the technological aspects of the game, you have a blast. And I think that Hearts of Iron 4 is oversimplified. Another really important aspect for me personally is that Hearts of Iron 3, with all of its DLCs, have a lot more content than Hearts of Iron 4 does. Hearts of Iron 4 is also more expensive. If you haven't picked up Hearts of Iron 3 yet, please, please, pick up the complete edition with all the DLCs. You'll, you'll just have a much better time learning to play the game and playing the game in general. So with all the technical stuff out of the way, let's actually start to learn how to play this game. Uh, for your first sessions with the game, I would highly recommend that you go for a single player match and that you play as one of the smaller countries in Europe with a high manpower. This is to keep things sort of simple, but still not uh, too simple. Uh, some of the smaller countries in Hearts of Iron 3 are very, very difficult to play because they don't have a lot of manpower. You can't create a lot of military units. They don't have very good technology. And they might be countries that are very early invaded if you have the AI set to a historical focus. So for your first game, I would highly, highly recommend that you try to, for example, to play as Hungary, Romania, France, or Germany. France or Germany are very large nations and they're going to have a lot of units, a lot of technology. Uh, but if you're coming from a game like Europa Universalis or Crusader Kings, then you might want to go for any of those. If you are not, I would highly, highly recommend to try out Hungary because they are a country that has decent technology, they have decent manpower, so you can create a lot of military units if you so wish, and they have a lot of expansion abilities, and it's very easy to learn to play Hearts of Iron 3 using one of these countries. So now that you have selected your country, you also have the options to start at certain historical intervals. You will see in the left corner there's a tab that says historical starts and you can choose multiple eras where different things have happened. I would highly recommend that you start the game with the road to war, which is the earliest date you can start the game. From there you can play until 1948 with their finest hour, which is a DLC that you guys hopefully picked up in the uh, collection, the Hearts of Iron 3 collection. So now that you have your country chosen, your historical start selected, on the right side of the screen you'll see a little box where it says options. I would recommend that you don't do not tinker too much with these in the beginning as this is mostly just difficulty and game mode settings. The only difference between having a uh, arcade setting and the normal setting is that supplies in your country is instead of being um, transported along actual lines of transport in the arcade mode your units will just pull supplies out of a national stock while in the normal mode as i mentioned there will actually be transport routes for supplies and if there's bad infrastructure you could expect to get uh, less supplies so now that we got all the game starts stuff set up and ready to go let's just go ahead and jump right into the game Click play. Now that you're in the game, if you're somewhat like me the first time I played this game, I just thought, what the fuck is this? What are these boxes? What is what are these numbers, these statistics? What is this stuff? If you if you were like me and you've 
like really never played any grand strategy games before, this stuff will be very, very foreign to you. If you are coming from European Universalis or any other grand strategy games, you will know what all this stuff is. Now, with all that nitty gritty stuff out of the way, let's actually jump into the game and start to learn how to control your armies, learn about the unit types and stuff like that. Now, if you jump into the game, and the game looks something along the lines of this, if you have 3D rendered units, I would highly recommend that you uh, enable this setting called Use Counters. Now, counters are a NATO type representation of units. So this cross with a white box signifies that it's an infantry type unit. And the HQ is obviously a, a headquarter type unit. Let's start and talk about the HQ type unit because it's one of the unit types they it is one of the unit types you will see the most in the game. Now in Hearts of Iron, uh, the game is built on a military hierarchy, so HQs have a certain place in the, in the hierarchy and military units or divisions have a certain place in the hierarchy as well. The X's on the top of the HQ signifies their place in the hierarchy and the lines also represent their place in the hierarchy. So in this case, the unit I have called Budapest HQ is my country's highest military headquarter type unit. They are the sort of supreme command unit of the entire army. Now if you want to get a visual representation of all the units, click on the HQ units that you have available and click on this tab on the side here and you can see all of the HQ types that we have and their place in the hierarchy. Now HQs do have quite a central role in how you play Hearts of Iron as your units get benefits from being well organized uh, in the hierarchy. It's important to know that units or rather headquarters on themselves cannot attack and defend at all. They're just a military they're just military staff. They don't have they don't have weapons or anything. So if you try to send them into battle, it will just retreat instantly. Now we're going to look more at headquarters later on, but right now let's learn how to maneuver units around and how to choose units. In Hearts of Iron, you have these provinces or these regions. If you stack units into a single province, you'll get this kind of a stack that you can see here in Budapest. And the way that I can see all the units in this region is either by highlighting them and then seeing the representation up in the left corner or I can physically click through each and every single unit in the stack. Now like I mentioned because of the hierarchy the unit with the highest rank is on top so in this case the general headquarters appears on top because it has the highest place in the hierarchy and the infantry style unit is uh, lowest but in the visual representation, because of how much manpower the infantry unit has, it is the highest in the uh, visual representation. Now, if you want to move a unit around, it's pretty simple. You just click on it and you right click where it wants to go. Now, when you right click on a region, it will automatically choose the fastest way to get there. But in some cases, you may want uh, for a unit to go through certain provinces, either because there's enemy, enemies there or maybe you want to flank someone. And the way you make uh, unit paths is by holding shift and then right clicking in the specific region you want it to go to. So by doing this I can, uh, I can uh, make a path for my unit to follow. So now I've, I've made a very long circle for my unit to follow over and over and over again. And it will, it will continue to follow uh, your orders until well it's either defeated or it has reached the end of the order cycle. Now as you can tell the game is standing still so we'll have to start the game. It's pretty simple. You can either start the game by pressing uh, the date and time counter but you can still tell by the uh, day night cycle representation in the lower left or in the lower right corner that things are still progressing pretty slowly. So by pressing the plus and minus signs, we can get time to pass quicker or slower. Uh, but it can be sort of troublesome to continuously press these buttons. So you have the, if you have a numpad on your keyboard, uh, numpad plus increases the speed and numpad minus decreases the speed. 
So I'd recommend that you play out, just play with it a little bit and, and see how it is. Now, giving units orders or selecting a certain path for them isn't the only way to move units around. If you have a unit that is far away and you want to move it to a certain province, you can make them move faster by using something called strategic redeployment. This will essentially make your unit load onto trains and all sorts of tra transport transportation uh, to make sure they get there faster, but in return their organization is, um, is highly decreased. So once they've reached their destination they need to reorganize and it will take them up to 150 hours before they can conduct any attacks. To do a strategic re-mobilization or a redeployment, hold control and right click the region you want them to go to. And you'll get this little box and you can um, you can set dates and times. So let's uh, just enable that and let's see it go along. You can tell the um, movement uh, arrow is now blue indicating that the unit is remobilizing. So now we've looked at how to move units around, we've looked at two unit types, but what about the other unit types? You've probably seen, uh, you probably saw these units right here on, uh, what is this, this is Czechoslovakia, on the Czechoslovakian border, and I would highly recommend that you go into your productions tab, click division, and you can see what unit types you can create. But in my case, there is a unit type that I can't create, and you might want to just search for uh, NATO unit counters on Google and just learn them by heart. And as you play this game, you will learn these very quickly because there aren't actually that many. So this cross is infantry, and these two dots are just wheels. So this is motorized infantry. This circle is a light armor, and this cross again is just regular infantry. Uh, and we can pop into the Productions tab, and we can see that G is Garrison. We have Armored Cars, Anti-Aircraft, Tank, and Artillery as well. Uh, and all these different unit types have different kinds of attributes. And let's talk a little bit about those right now. Now, we're not going to get, we're not going to look at the Productions tab yet, we're just looking at unit types. So, uh, in Hearts of Iron, you follow a certain uh, structure to divisions. What you usually will have is three primary uh, assault divisions and then one support division. For example, uh, three infantry brigades and then one artillery brigade. Um, you, you can, of course, add like four support divisions or support brigades if you want to, but your unit's attack will be quite low and they won't really have any stamina in battle. Now, later on in the game, you can add more support units as well. Uh, and I, I also highly recommend that you do not add four infantry brigades to a division because uh, the infantry on its own needs support. They, they need something. You can tell by this representation down here that they do need something to support them. Now, obviously, infantry isn't the only kind of unit. You have garrisons, which are great for defending certain cities. They will actually have higher defensiveness than regular infantry units, but they are very slow. Uh, you have more um, old-fashioned cavalry, which are very fast, but are very soft, so uh, they might not, they're might not they not effective against armor, for example, and they'll need support that way. Uh, there's armor, which is also usually combined with either infantry or mechanized and motorized infantry when you get those later on. Uh, there's also militia, which are great for um, uh, rebel suppression. Uh, they're great if you need, if you if you suddenly find yourself in a drastic situation and you need units fast, militia is a good example of that. Uh, so those are all the kind of units we looked at right now are primary primary units, and the rest of the units we're going to look at are support units. So they will need to cooperate with infantry. They can't really do anything on their own. We have armored cars, which adds what we would, we would call uh, toughness or hardness to uh, units, so they can attack forts and stuff like that more eff effectively. There's uh, anti-aircraft, obviously, which can defend yourself. You can defend yourself. You can defend yourself nicely or against um, air attacks. Anti-tank for uh, defending yourself against tanks. And again, and uh, last, you have artillery for uh, dealing higher soft attack on other infantry type units 
And then there's military police, which I think you will end up using quite rarely. I don't use military police too much myself, but if you do control large land masses, you might need military police to control um, uh, to control some of those provinces you have captured because uh, you will you will most likely capture countries that you don't have a claim on, and the population within those states will start to uprise. They'll start rebellions and stuff, and you'll need the military police along with infantry there to uh, suppress those rebels. Now there are way more infantry type units that I haven't mentioned or main type of type of units that I haven't mentioned, uh, but these are unlocked through research. So for, uh, for your first couple of years in the game, these are the divisions you'll have available. And uh, I think you'll be able to sort of figure out by yourself what these kind of units, um, what kind of attributes they have and, and so forth. Uh, so now that we've looked at the units, we've looked at some of their basic attributes, we've looked at how to move units around and stuff like that, let's start to take a look at the uh, resources that you have in this game. This game is a game where you are like, you're a prime leader of your country. You control everything from politics to resources. So you need to manage all this stuff. Uh, and the more, produ the more stuff you produce, the more resources you will also use. Uh, you can get more resources by either capturing countries or by researching, um, researching technologies which make you more effective at getting those resources. Uh, for example, right now you can tell we have power or energy, we have metal, rare materials, and crude oil. And right now you can also tell by the stats that we are using quite a lot of these materials and we are actually going in a deficit. So what we would need to do is either produce more of a certain type of resource and then sell it to buy more of that resource type, uh, or we need to just produce more of it. Uh, money is also a very central resource in this game as you will obviously use money to buy resources from other states Next up there's manpower now manpower is used for creating military units uh, And also for a bunch of other things This is one of your most important resources and you can get more manpower by uh, changing your laws And we're gonna look at we're gonna look at the laws tab later on next up we have diplomatic influence you use diplomatic influence points to, for example, send trade deals, declare war, make alliances, and all kinds of stuff. The next resource we have is espionage. Now, this is just, uh, as you can tell, it says representing not spies, but the entire infrastructure supporting them. So this basically means how many spies and how, what kind of infrastructure you have available to do espionage on other states. Through espionage, you can uh, raise dissent levels in their country. That's also what we're going to look at next. Uh, you can uh, flip political parties. You can do research on what kind of unit types they're making, what they are researching, and all kinds of crazy stuff. Next up, there is the officer ratio. Obviously, officers are a very central part in any military style of unit, and you will need a certain amount of officers uh, to, have an, to have your orga army organized properly. Now next up there is Descent, and Descent is the sh <laughs> short-term unhappiness of your people. If you do not pr produce enough consumer goods, your people will become unhappy, and there's also a bunch of events that you can do uh, which may give you higher Descent. Now you need to keep that Descent low, because if the Descent goes too high, your factories will start being disabled, and in the end you might actually lose all of your factories which are extremely important next there's national unity now the way wars and conquering nations work in hearts of iron 3 is that you do this by conquering what are called victory points the green regions that are highlighted right here are my victory points so right now i have 69 percent national unity which means which means that the enemy needs to capture 69 percent of my victory points before I will automatically surrender my entire country. And we can use spies, amongst other things, to raise our national unity. Now, one of the first tabs we're going to take a look at in the game is the Diplomacy tabs. Hearts of Iron 3 sorts different kinds of things into these tabs and you will spend a lot of time here, so it is important that you learn 
what these tabs are for and what you can do in them essentially. So the first thing you'll notice in the diplomacy tab is this triangle. As you can probably tell, the three different factions in this game are represented in this triangle and all of the countries that are in the middle of the triangle are all the countries that can uh, drift towards a certain uh, political power. So for example, the United States is currently drifting very close to the Allies, but they are, <laughs> for right, at least for now, neutral. Uh, Austria, for example, are drifting very closely to the Axis, and this country is very closely drifting towards the Comintern. And everyone else in the middle is sort of, they have a drifting direction, but you can, you can spend diplomatic influence points actually to make these drift towards your faction if you so want to. Uh, from policies and different kinds of things, you will notice that it says who they're drifting towards. So for example, Norway is drifting towards the Allies with a value of 2.49 and 1.18 towards the axis and 1.17 towards the Comintern. Below that line you can tell it says uh, different kinds of attributes towards why they're drifting uh, to these factions and you can affect these you, you can affect this drift quite effectively. Uh, now your diplomacy tab is also the tab you use for trading so actually since we're lacking quite a few resources let's start by buying some Let's start by buying some energy from a country that produces a lot of energy. You can sort countries that produce the most and least of a certain resource by pressing on the resource. And then you can tell that the if the icon turns red, then they have a deficit. And we're actually the, we're actually the country in the world with the highest deficit of energy right now. Uh, so let's find a country with the most, and it's America. Now, the problem is that we cannot offer... A trade agreement to the United States because I don't have a port for them to transport energy to my continent. So instead we'll have to find a country that we either share borders with or we share common borders with so we can transport it through another country. So there's lots of different powers here um, but I want to ask let's ask Germany. Let's click on offer trade agreement and let's click on buy for some energy and we need 27.3 energy so let's get let's get 27 energy let's get 28 and we can tell that per day I'll have to pay them 1.08 money and I'm actually just making 0 0.54 but I'm going to sell some fuel to another country that needs it uh, so I can earn that money back in. So let's send a tr trade agreement to Germany. Let's start the game and let's see what they say. You can tell they accept it immediately because they are producing a lot of extra power and I'm sure that they need the money. Next, let's go ahead and get, sell, let's go ahead and sell some fuel. Um, now it looks like everyone is actually producing enough fuel for now, but once once country starts going to war, they're going to need more fuel. Let's see if we can actually find a country that needs fuel. So everyone is producing a surplus of one fuel per day right now. Um, let's find a country that has very low, uh, very low surplus of fuel. So we tried offering, or we haven't tried offering a deal yet, but Germany is immediately saying that it is impossible for them to accept the deal. This is sort of a way for you to save diplomatic points because you can get an indication towards what the way they're going to drift. If it says very likely, they will most likely accept, but if it says impossible, it's, I've never actually seen them accept a trade deal if it says impossible in the predicted outcome. So for this time, we'll just have to wait and, uh, and see if there's any AI who will offer us agreements because AI or the AI in the game will automatically give you trade agreements, uh, which benefits them and you. The next tab we're going to take a look at is also one of the most important ones, and it is the production tab. We already had a look at the division production tab for creating units, but now we're going to look at it uh, in like a larger scale, basically.
You can say it says that we have 33 industrial capacity and this is obviously the capacity we have to produce certain things. So in our example, you can see it says that we need 12 or 11.42 industrial capacity points to be spent on upgrades to give new upgrades to our armed forces. So let's click on the need button. And what this is going to do, it's going to set the slider to the need and it's going to lock it. What you can usually do is slide these around, but I'd highly recommend that you just try uh, first just uh, like getting all the needed stuff and then producing an excess of consumer goods and th this will make your population happy as well. Otherwise you can spend uh, more consumer or more industrial capacity on producing supplies. Countries will very often buy supplies off of you which can give you a profit so you can get enough resources of the other things. Now we already had a look at the division production tab but there is also a brigade attachment tab. If I want to produce artillery for my, for my already existing infantry brigades, I can just produce uh, attachments which I can deploy along with my new infantry units or my old ones rather, and I can combine them together to a single unit if there is space in the stack. Next up, there's the air wing production tab for producing bombers, interceptors, uh, naval planes and different kinds of stuff like that. And last but not least, there is the flotilla tab, but sadly Hungary doesn't have any naval borders, so we can't actually produce anything other than transports, but we will not be able to deploy them. Uh, of course, if you end up conquering a country that has a, uh, has a shore on it or has naval lines, you will be able to produce, uh, you will be able to produce and deploy navies. So next up we have a few more tabs to go through. It is the technology tab. Now your technology tab is where you research stuff for your armies, your industry. You can research uh, land infrastructure. You can research excavation for getting more resources and all kinds of things. Nuclear bombs, radars, all kinds of stuff. This is also the tab where you assign leadership to your espionage, to your diplomacy and to your officers. So in my case, I have 7.08 leadership points and you can get more leadership points by uh, researching education. So I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to research education and I want a few of these other things as well, but let's take a look at that later. Um, I'm going to spend 0 0.6 on spies because I'm just going to use spies to increase uh, my national unity and we're going to look at that uh, in the next tab. And uh, I really don't need any more diplomatic influence points, I'm going to set that to zero. And uh, I don't need more than 3.1 officers per day. And you'll just have to play around with these tabs because there isn't really, there isn't really a need. There's just a what you should and shouldn't put into them. So now that I've given out all of my leadership, let's start, let's start taking a look at what I actually need. Uh, since we are a very infantry based country, some country are more naval or aviation based. We will need everything that can give us an advantage in war. So let's start researching um, small arms, which are, which are small handheld weapons for our soldiers. Uh, let's get mountain infantry because we will invading. We will be invading regions with a lot of mountains. Let's also start getting uh, combat medicine which will absolutely help us to prevent casualties because we don't have that much manpower. We're also going to research electronical and mechanical engineering, which will later on unlock radios, which will be very effective for our soldiers. And last but not least, we have the land tab. And there's these other tabs as well, but you'll have to play around with them yourself. The land tab, if you are an infantry-based country, is, I would say, probably the second most important tab in the game. This is where you research stuff for your infantry units so that they are, for example, more organized, as you can tell. Uh, and that is going to be very important to us. So in our case, we are going to want to research operational level organization, which will reduce the amount of time between attacks by 24 hours, which is insane when you're actually in war. Uh, other than that, we might go for large fronts, um, 
let's go for infantry warfare as well. Now you can see that I've spent or I'm researching more than I actually have available or more I'm researching more than I have points available to assign to research. So the operational and level organizations one will be um, reduced to a certain percentage and the infantry warfare one will be won't be researched at all until we have completed one of the other projects and that project will then go to the bottom of the queue and then it will just continue until you either remove or add uh, things to the queue. One more, th one more thing that is worth noting in the technology tab is that if I'm going to research something that I do not already know a lot of, it will be harder and harder for me to research. So you can tell it says land, infantry, and theory. Uh, it says infantry theory is 2.4 and infantry practical is also 2.4. Uh, for example, if I have a, if I, if I haven't used my infantry units at all, I will have uh, low numbers and I might have to go for some theory to speed up the research. You can tell how difficult or how easy something is to research by looking at the numbers behind each technology. A higher number means that it's more difficult to research. The next tab we have to look at is the politics tab. Uh, as I mentioned, you are supreme leader of your country, so you can choose uh, your politicians in your government by yourself, and there's no repercussions for replacing them, essentially. Uh, so certain politicians and certain ministers have certain uh, have certain points that I might or may not want. For example, my foreign minister right now is this guy. Uh, but if I want my country to drift more towards a democratic principle, I might want to replace him with a de more democratic politician, which would be this guy. And you can play around with these different tabs and just see who is available uh, available to have in your government. The next thing we have to look at are our laws. Now laws have a huge impact on your economy and the way you run your country. Uh, for example, the most easy one to explain is the conscription laws. The stricter conscription laws you have, the more manpower you will have available in your country. For example, uh, my the volunteer army law I mean, one would give me 50% less officer recruitment it would give me 50% 50, 50 less manpower in peacetime and so forth so generally speaking every law that is in the bottom of each of these tabs are going to be better for you as a leader and you can tell I can actually change the law right now so we're going to do that yes there we go and we can also go for specialist training. Uh, training laws give our unit more experience once they deploy in the field. Next up, there's also the mobilization button, uh, which essentially means that your units, or you may have units that are unmobilized to save manpower in peacetime. And once you mobilize your country or you are declared war on, they will gain uh, they will gain full operational status. There's also the popularity tab which uh, tells you something about how your country is going and so forth and if one political party um, if, if one political party gets too popular you might actually have a revolution or a coup in your country as well. The next tab we're going to look at is the intelligence tab. Now I talked about spies and spy networks in the technologies tab and we're going to look more at that now. Now, personally, I don't think that espionage on other countries have that big of an effect, but you'll have to play around with this uh, yourself. Uh, the most eye-striking tab is this internals tab, where it would sell. It will say how many free spies we have, how many active spies we have in other countries, how many active domestic spies we have, our partisan efficiency and how many spies we have caught in our country or detected rather not actually caught and then there's also the neutrality which tells you something about how much of a threat you are to other countries 
Now in my case, the national unity is quite low, so we're actually gonna uh, make sure that our, our spies focus on racing our national unity, which is going to be really important in case we go to war. What I also want to do is because we are going to declare war on Romania and Yugoslavia later on, is actually, is actually send some spies over to them. So let's find them in the list. And one easy way to find a country instead of browsing through the entire list is just by clicking a region in their country and then clicking the tab you want them you want the country to come up on. So I clicked the region in Yugoslavia, I clicked the intelligence tab, and they're here. So let's do some um, let's do some military espionage. Let's set the priority to one. And let's do the same for Romania as well, since we are going to invade them later on. Now you can play around with the different uh, tabs here and it will be up to you um, to decide whether or not it is worth, for example, doing tech espionage or counter espionage or whatever it may be. Um, but for the most part, I'd recommend that you at least have the highest priority to raising your national unity. Because if you go to war and you are so unlucky to lose a victory point, it is really important that your entire country doesn't just automatically surrender if you actually end up losing a province. Now, one of the final tabs we're going to look at is the theaters tab. Uh, when you play Hearts of Iron, you have the option to let the AI basically do everything for you. Uh, it's called micro or, or macroing. Uh, personally, I prefer microing where you control each and every single one of your divisions yourself. But in a lot of the larger scale battles, you will need the help of your AI. Otherwise, you will just lose and spend a million years trying to micro control everything that your entire army is doing. And the theaters tab is a nice way to see what kind of need um, your different headquarters have uh, because headquarters can be automatically controlled and we'll look at that in a few seconds. Now next up we have two tabs that you probably aren't going to use very much but there is a statistics tab which gives you an overview of different kinds of things and there is also a strategic warfare tab which uh, can show you different kinds of uh, casualties and all this all kinds of stuff about battles so now that I have given you guys a general overview of how to play the game let's actually invade a country and you'll I'll, uh, bring you guys along step by step um, on how we're going to do things so the first thing that I have I haven't talked about yet or I mentioned it briefly but I haven't talked too much about how neut neutrality works to declare war on someone you will need a certain neutrality or they will need a certain neutrality in in percentage towards your neutrality and changing your your neutrality can be quite a slow process so I personally prefer to cheat just a little bit and set my country's neutrality to zero so I can declare war on anyone I want just to speed the gameplay up a bit to set your neutrality to zero we're gonna enter a cheat and to get the um, command console to open hold alt and press 2 and 1 on your numpad at the same time and we're gonna write none neutrality you can see it prints out no longer neutral and that will enable us to declare war on whomever we want without the need to lower our neutrality which will speed up the game gameplay quite a lot and it is something that I usually do uh, as long as the people people I play with accept it because it's not if you're if you are going to reduce your neutrality to zero you're gonna spend probably a couple of years doing that and that will make the game a little bit too slow in my opinion but that is just how things are now um, let's in decide who to invade I'm thinking to invade uh, Yugoslavia and then work my way around the world um, so we're going to send all of our units toward our borders obviously so let's go ahead and place our units along the border 
and we can see we have a bunch of stuff rolling in now so let's talk about that uh, this is an event you can choose different kinds of outcomes for the different kinds of events depending on what may or may not benefit you uh, so we have a reorganization of the foreign ministry you can read all this stuff if you want but what's the, mo the most important thing is that you read the effects so if I press on good initiative I will get a 10% higher daily descent which will require me to spend more industrial capacity on producing consumer goods to make everyone happy or I can go for there's no need which will make me drift less internally towards a certain faction and in my case I don't really want to be a part of a faction so I'm going to press there is no need now there's also some trade agreements rolling in so let's start taking a look at those now the Soviet Union wants me to give them 20 supplies and we are we are producing an excess and we have almost no money left so let's definitely give them the agreement that they want uh, Germany is offering us some metal or some energy sorry uh, we are producing three extra energy but we could use some extra so let's uh, let's do that as well I'm also going to place my headquarters behind uh, the front line because they can get a little bit intrusive so we are going to do that as well. Let's speed up the game and let's watch our units uh, take place on the front lines. Okay, now, one peculiar thing you might have noticed is that I talked about that there should be three regiments in each division and Hungary doesn't do that. They have two regiments in each division. And if you, if you, for example, have very few, if you have no manpower and you're going to defend a lot of space, that might be the decent thing to do if you, if you have an inferior or inferior enemy. Uh, but in my case, I really can't see why they've done that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine as many units as I can. Uh, and I'm going to do this by putting them in the same province and then clicking the merge button which is this button right here let's press on it and now you can see we have four regiments in each division which is one more that I want so we're gonna create new unit put one of the regiments by themselves and then we'll send them back I'm just gonna repeat this process all along all along the uh, the country here Mm -hmm. Yeah, hang on a sec. Let's just speed up the time a bit so the units move uh, where we want them. Let's send this guy over here. And let's merge these together so we have three regiments. And again, we got a trade agreement for four metal, and we actually need that, so we'll accept. We'll combine these two and then send one of the extra regions or extra um, regiments off. Send this guy back, combine these to two. Uh, send this guy over here as well. Combine these guys to so we have a full unit here. Then we'll send one more guy out combine these we'll have a full unit there that's nice so it looks like we'll only have uh, a single unit that is going to only have two regiments in it which is going to be this unit right here let's just speed up time so everyone is deployed okay so you may you may or may not want to do that I would really like to have that structure because uh, each of each one of your units are stronger that way uh, but obviously you are able to cover less land but I would ha rather personally have a higher attack now you can already see that because we are doing military intelligence on Yugoslavia 
I can see where many of their units are, and that is going to benefit me in battle. Uh, next, what I'm going to do is um, make sure all my stuff is placed okay. And we also have an extra unit. We have one more unit um, quite far behind, back in our capital. And right now, I would like uh, I would like all of my units on the front lines. So let's just send them to the front lines. And this final unit here, we're just gonna. Oh wait, actually, it's this unit. Okay, yeah. So this guy over, and then combine them. So this guy is gonna have four infantry regiments, um, but that is going to be okay. Now, to prepare ourselves for, for battle, what I'm going to do is actually mobilize all of my armies. And once that they have gotten the necessary manpower, we are going to march straight into Yugoslavia. Uh, but before we do that, we have forgotten to talk about something which is quite important. When you select a unit, you'll see all these kinds of buttons and weird things. And I haven't explained this yet, so it might be a little bit confusing. Now. Um, I talked about unit hierarchies, so um, when you press a unit, you see the names above the unit you have selected. These are the different kinds of headquarters. So my unit is linked to this headquarter, which is linked to this one, which is linked to general headquarters, which is linked to Budapest HQ, which is our nation's highest um, military order. Uh, beneath that you'll have a little name of your leader and leaders have a big impact on your units so we're gonna look at those next there's also a name so we can actually change our name here let's change it to first I'm just gonna change it to first infantry division um, just to play around with it show you guys how these work uh, next to this we have our supply meter indicating how many supplies we have and how much percentage of supplies we have there's also a fuel. We don't have the, we only use fuel for heating, um, but tanks and motorized infantry will use fuel to move around. There's also our weight indicating if, uh, like if our weight is too high, we can't, for example, be loaded onto transport ships. Just as an example, we have our supply routes. We have our maximum speed and we have our attrition. Now attrition will come into play if I'm, for example, in enemy territory, if it's really hot or really cold or swampy or different kinds of things. And you can reduce, um, you can you can reduce the attrition by researching uh, certain kinds of gear in the technology tab, right here: airborne, Arctic, mountain, jungle, desert, all the kind, all these kinds of things. So there's a couple of more buttons still that we need to look at. We have the red or the button with the red arrow. This will actually detach our unit from its place in the hierarchy. For example, if I want a new type of headquarter because I have a large country maybe and I want the, uh, the infantry unit to be in direct contact with our primary headquarters maybe. Um, well, there's a bunch of different reasons why you may want new armies. For example, if I want to control one army myself, and then I want one army to be um, uh, to be AI controlled. Next up, we have prioritizing or the star button. Essentially, it's, it's a button with a star. Um, you can use this button to prioritize what units get upgrades faster than others. So units that are prioritized will get upgrades faster than other units. Next up, there's the reinforcement button. If you want or do not want a certain unit to may or may not get um, reinforcements, you can press on that one. Uh, then there is the buttons for receiving upgrades at all. Then there are the, there's two buttons, one for loading them onto um, naval transport ships to do naval invasions. And then there's the one for putting them on planes if you have paratroopers. You can also disband your unit if you, for example, have, let's say I have too many headquarter type units. Let's create a headquarter type unit right now. Let's unlink this one, make a new headquarter type, and then let's link that into the hierarchy. And you can say that I now have an extra headquarter type unit 
and to, to disband it again, if I don't want it, I can press this and then it will be disbanded and I can relink my unit in the hierarchy. So now that we've looked at the stats of the units and different kinds of things, let's actually go to war and it'll talk you through the process of declaring war and all of that stuff. Um, there's a couple of more things that I should have... I could explain more about the uh, unit stats, but I think it's better if you just play around with it yourself and you'll really quickly learn what these kinds of things mean. And they're sort of self-explanatory. So I don't see the need to explain this stuff. There's speed, soft, heart attack, what, how much manpower or strength they have, and these kinds of things. So now, I think the time has come to... Let's first mobilize, actually. We haven't mobilized yet. We'll mobilize. We can see we have a mobilization notification here. Let's speed up the time so um, all of our units will start getting reinforcements from the national pool. And now we'll have to go into the production tab and assign industrial capacity to our um, our army so they'll actually get reinforcements. If we don't, if we do not have an industrial capacity to give to reinforcements, no reinforcements will be passed to our actual units. So we're going to do that right now. And right now we're just waiting to see if uh, things are processing okay. You can see our reinforcement need is now again zero. So let's um, do this. And since all of our units are now doing uh, completely fine, we can actually go ahead and declare war. Uh, quickly, quick mention, these small icons are just telling you that certain things may or may not be happening. So I have, I'm researching combat medicine, but it's two years ahead in research. So there's no other countries out there that are currently researching combat medicine. And then my country is mobilized in peacetime and I'm wasting industrial capacity, which just means that I'm spending too much on what is needed, essentially. Let's click their flag and click declare war. Let's click conquer to conquer all of their cores. If I, for example, just want a certain province, maybe because uh, I have a claim, like I actually do here. I have a claim on uh, on this region right here. You can see it says Hungary has a claim on this province. Uh, but I'm going to conquer their entire country because because I want to. So right now, you can tell we are at war. You heard the sound. It's very distinctive. Now we have a new notification that we can enact new laws, and we are going to do that. We can enact service by requirement for conscription laws, which will give us more manpower. And we can also enact total economic mobilization, which will give us 50% more industrial capacity. It will give us a lot less money, but we're doing very well on money anyway. Now, all that's left to do really is start attacking the enemy by right clicking on their regions. Let's just do that all across the front line here. And I talked about victory points and how important they are. So let's look at the map modes here. And let's click the one with the star. It says VP map mode. Now the regions marked in red are currently the enemy victory points. So I will need to capture a certain percentage of these to make the enemy surrender. And to find that percentage, all you need to do is click on one of these victory points, click on their flag, and hold your mouse over this green bar here. You see it says they have 0.00 of their important cities occupied and are currently at a national unity of 59.6%. If the occupation is higher than the national unity, then they will surrender. So we need to capture 60% of the victory points, then they'll give up. That's basically what that means. There's also uh, these different kinds of map modes, and you'll just have to play around with these a little bit yourself and see uh, which will benefit you. The victory point one is the most important one, and then um, the ter terrain mode as well is quite important. Uh, you can also see resources if you are looking for a certain kind of resource, 
and you can you can make battle plans as well if you want that kind of thing. We'll talk about that a little bit later. For now, though, let's uh, let's just start our war here. You can see it says one right away because a headquarter type unit cannot defend on its own. And I mentioned that a little earlier as well. So you can see we're starting to push into enemy provinces here. Now it's really important that you don't, it's really important that you're not too aggressive and give the enemy an opportunity to flank you. Um, if you're really unlucky and an, an enemy is able to flank you, they can actually just sort of walk right past your front lines and in a worst case scenario, walk right into your capital without you being able to do anything. Now, I have, my units have been in some combat now, but this unit right here is still in combat. So I'm going to click on this line right here, which is the bombing of Zagreb. And since I control Zagreb right now, the enemy is bombing it. And you can see how the battle is progressing. And uh, we'll look at this more when we are in regular, regular battle as well. Now, certain regions may have certain kinds of infrastructure. For example, for example, uh, a city might have uh, anti-air guns, which will help them defend uh, against bombings. And you can build different kinds of um, different kinds of stuff to help you defend. For example, land forts and stuff like that. The way you do that is by clicking on a certain province and then clicking on the upgrade that you want down in the left corner. So right over here, we're actually in a battle with a um, a cavalry unit from Yugoslavia. And this number indicator is indicating in whose favor the battle is going. So when it's yellow and I'm attacking, it means that the battle could go either way. But the number 59 indicates that it's going in my favor. The higher the number is in my favor when I'm attacking, uh, the higher the battle is going in my favor. So in a second, it'll turn to 60 and then the number will turn green. And it went down to 57, sadly, but <laughs> that's that's how it goes. And that means that, oh, you can see that they surrendered. Uh, their unit is pulling back. Now, right here, you can tell we're actually in a bit of a pickle because uh, the enemy clearly has a lot more units than we do. And if we're not careful enough, we could end up, uh, they could end up walking behind our front lines, which I said that we had to um, be aware of. You can see it's happening right here, actually, which is interesting. Right here again, you have the numeric value, which is currently green, which means that the battle is turning in my favor. And there's also this line right here, which indicates wh whose favor the battle is going in. I can also click on the battle like this and see more stats about what kind of tactics uh, the enemy is using. What I'm doing right here is combining two units in a uh, in a collaborated attack, which is a strategy you're going to use a lot. It's probably the most common strategy, rather obviously. So right here, we're actually losing, and our units ended up losing the battle, and they were so defeated that they ended up pulling back, and this gray arrow is indicating that they are retreating. So right here, my unit is actually right outside their capital, but we're not going to push yet because this front uh, was defeated and we have to wait for them to come back. Uh, this yellow line is indicating that our unit is reorganizing. And if we hover over this cross right beneath our unit, it says that this unit has currently recently been attacking and cannot organize another attack for the next 90 hours. So we'll have to wait 90 hours before this attack right here can actually commence. 
Now, there were a few things that I didn't talk about that I felt like we should talk about before going to war. So let's talk about that stuff first. When you produce a unit and it has been finished producing or it's, it's done, basically, you'll get this notification up in the left corner and you can deploy your unit anywhere within your core territory. So, for example, if I have conquered Yugoslavia, I won't be able to, to deploy my unit in an area that is outside of my core. So that is something uh, to notice. Also, always make sure that you have enough units uh, to make attacks. I played uh, one match with uh, Hungary and I ended up, I ended up not, having, uh, not having enough units. So it's really important to make sure that you do have enough units at all times and that you don't, um, you don't overstep your boundaries. So once you actually end up winning a war, you'll obviously get uh, these kinds of messages. Now, when you go to war, like I mentioned, you can enact certain laws, and once you're at peace again, those laws will be retracted. Um, and in this case, since we actually went for a annex, a total annex of Yugoslavia, they are now part of our country. And one thing that is important to notice is that um, we will now have a quite high risk of, um, of rebel uprisings. So now for the final chapter in this over one hour long tutorial is going to be how to build land forts and other things in provinces. The way you do this is just simply by clicking on the province and down in the left corner you'll see all these small buttons that you may or may not be able to press. And when you press these you will start constructing a certain level of, for example, land forts, airfields, anti-air guns, naval bases, whatever be it. Do note, like I mentioned, that you might not be able to press these buttons. If you, do, if you haven't researched um, advanced construction engineering in a technology industry tab yet, you're probably going to need to have to do that. So I think that actually concludes this tutorial. I don't have much else to show you guys and with if you have watched this entire hour-long tutorial, you will have learned very well how to play Hearts of Iron 3, at least, I believe so. Uh, as a side note, I just want to make a point out of the fact that uh, there are a bunch of things that I didn't mention in this tutorial that may or may not affect the way you play Hearts of Iron 3. For example, I didn't mention uh, the ranges that headquarters have, I didn't mention uh, didn't show you guys how to load up on airplanes and flotillas. I didn't talk about uh, too much about Navy, Navy stuff or Air Force stuff because honestly those things aren't that important in this game. This game primarily focuses on the army sets. Um, so I just wanted to make a point out of that. Uh, so with that being said, uh, if you guys enjoyed this type of content and you enjoyed watching me play some Hearts of Run 3. I also have a Twitch where I do play a lot of Hearts of Run 3 and a lot of other games. Um, the link is in the description so you can stop by and say hi. Otherwise, if there's anything specific that you guys are wondering about, don't be afraid to leave comments. Uh, I don't get that many comments, so I, I have the opportunity to reply to all of those. Uh, so thank you so much for watching. I hope this was learnful to you in some way. And uh, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time whenever that is. Bye bye.